<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the National Quilter Circle. This is our live Q&A. My name is Leah. I'm your moderator. We're with you to answer all of your questions for all of your quilting needs. Uh, but before we dig into the questions, just a few quick reminders from me. So first of all, in order to drop your questions into the chat box, you're going to want to check out the chat box below the video player if you're watching on the website. Or if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can use the chat there as well. We get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have. And we always have a lot of fun with a little bit of crowdsourcing as well. So if you like, you can even drop a hello in. Let us know where it is you're viewing from. And then as your questions come to you, drop those into the chat box throughout about an hour we usually have for these Q&As. The other thing I want to draw your attention to before we get to your questions is a little free download for you. So you'll want to check out the description of today's video and you'll find a chicken mitten potholder pattern, which I was warned about. I practiced saying it, chicken mitten potholder pattern. That's a free download for you to grab just by clicking the link in the description. And that's something for you to take with you even after we sign off for today. So that's all the reminders for me. It's time to bring on today's answerer of our Q&A. It's Colleen Talkey. She's frequently with us. I have to say, welcome back to another one of our Q&As. Uh, love you to start out with a little update. What have you been up to? Maybe talk a little bit about that pattern uh, and anything else that's been on your mind, Colleen. Welcome. Well, great. Thanks, Leah. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. We are um, featuring the chicken mitten. I'll say the potholder pattern, mm -hmm, nice and slow. But the chicken mitten was created um, in the past as a, a fun Easter kind of project. Looks like an egg. It's going to protect your hands when you're reaching into the oven. Um, it uses insole bright inside, so it's a reflective material that maybe you haven't used before, something to look into, a product maybe that you would like to use in pot holders or oven mitts. So the chicken mitten is your little freebie for today. Um, the pattern has the template in it, talks about cutting bias binding, putting um, layering everything together. So there's all kinds of fun little things to um, learn in that pattern. And we have been working on Facebook Live projects. Um, we did the Tulip Tango last week. Um, we have some fun projects coming up. So always be looking for those notices about Facebook Live. Um, we even have an Earth Day project coming up next week. So be looking for that, a way to reuse, repurpose, recycle, um, all kinds of fun projects across a lot of different platforms. So if you aren't a quilter, maybe you're a knitter or a crocheter or a crafter, you'll find something in the mix that you will be able to jump into for a new project for um, honoring the, the planet that we live on and reusing, repurposing and recycling items. So we always have projects kind of in the mix. I sat down and wrote out another six months of ideas for Facebook Live. So you just never know what will pop up as our next Facebook Live project. <laughs> Of course, we always want to hear from you. So if there's anything that you're thinking, oh, gosh, I would really love a Facebook Live that's talking about this particular mm -hmm. aspect of quilting, let us know. I know Colleen would love to take that into consideration. Yep. Uh, ooh, I have to say, Lisa already put it into our chat here, but happy Easter to those of us that are Yay. looking forward to Easter this coming weekend. Uh, it is a wonderful springtime. We're getting a little bit of green, getting a little bit of rain, but the green is coming as well. The tulips are coming up. Uh, we would love to know what it is that you're working on and any questions you have about your projects for Colleen. We do have some all ready to go. So Colleen, you want to dig in? Okay, let's go. I'm ready. All right, let's go to Sherry first. Uh, so Sherry asks, how do you draw your own paper piece pattern for scrapbooks? So Sherry's tried to do it freehand before and paint myself into a corner a little more <laughs> often than not. But what do you have to say about that? Um, when it comes to paper piecing, it's sometimes if it's paper foundation piecing that you're trying to do, trying to figure out the sections that will fit together can be a little bit tricky. So I think the easiest way that I learned how to do that um, was to study other people's projects and how they sliced apart sections so that I would have a complete wedge or section to put together. Because in foundation paper piecing, if that's the style, because there's a couple of different terms when it comes to foundation 
um, piecing out there, but if it's paper foundation, you're building on a piece of paper, the, the sections of a design, and those need to be sections that can stand alone. So you need to kind of work either from one side of that paper um, across to cover the entire section, or work from the center and be thinking always about coming to the outer edge. So it's a little bit tricky. So I think that the easiest way to grasp the concept of how to create your own and cut it apart efficiently to create the sections that you need to actually piece is to study what other people do. Um, we learn where a lot of us as quilters were very visual learners. So seeing how it's cut apart and created can be the easiest form of learning out there. So I would say study what other people are working on, look for some videos. Um, I think that I've done some in the past. They may not have been with National Culture Circle, but I bet National Culture Circle also has a few um, lessons on foundation paper um, piecing that our moderator could probably put a link to. And that will help you understand the concept of, okay, I have to create this entire section before I can and, and have it completely covered with fabric before I do the next section, because then those are later linked together. You can't can't paint yourself into a corner and have two seams that you need to complete and they have to they have to overlap in a way. So um, creating those patterns yourself can be a bit challenging. So I say go back and study what other people do. Start to understand the concept of how to work kind of from the inside out or from one side to another in a section. And then you'll start to grasp the idea of how to cut your design apart. You may have to even alter your design a bit in order to kind of fit that um, format or style of piecing, but it can be done. So there are so many intricate um, paper foundation designs out there that are so amazing that once you get the hang of it, you'll create wonderful um, quilt tops and projects after that. All right, hopefully that is helpful for anybody that's looking into paper piecing for things like that. Uh, Karen's got our next question and Karen is here to talk about batting a little bit. So Karen mm -hmm. wants to know what is the best batting to use for flannel quilts, specifically looking for something that does not add too much weight. What can you suggest? Okay, um, when you're working with flannel, a lot of people do want a little bit lighter weight batting and there are mm -hmm. different, um, densities or thicknesses, lofts of batting that are available. Um, probably the, the lightest weight of all of them might be a polyester batting. Some people will go that direction. Others will say, 100% mm, cotton, all of my fabrics are 100% cotton, I want 100% cotton batting also. So then they shy away from the polyester. But polyester is a possibility. It is very lightweight. It creates um, space where air gets trapped and that's what causes a quilt to be warm is when that air layer is trapped between the top and the backing so a polyester back is a possibility um, otherwise go to the lowest loft batting out there um, there are very fine battings some people don't even want the extra weight of a batting and maybe even put a flannel sheet or flannel um, fabric in between if they don't want extra extra weight in there, but even a flannel, um, piece of flannel fabric in between will cause, create some weight to it. Um, just look for the lowest loft batting. I tend to use the my standard 70-30 quilter's dream um, batting in almost all of my projects. I guess because I live in Iowa and the weather changes so dramatically <laughs> and it gets so cold that I want that extra layer in there, but the quilter's dream is fairly fine. Um, you can go to a, an even um, lighter loft batting. Um, just do a little research and see what's available in your area and ask at your local quilt shop. They are great. And I'm sure with all of the quilters we have listening right now, um, drop in what is your favorite low loft batting that you enjoy using with a flannel um, quilt top that, um, that you've experienced in the past. And we'll get all kinds of really good information that way too. Now, Colleen, uh, if you have any considerations for washing uh, with different battings, is there anything to consider for this particular topic? Yep, there is. Okay, if you're using a cotton batting with your flannels, you're gonna get that shrink, that crinkly look like an aged quilt. 
with a polyester batting, you won't get as much. You will get some of that crinkle effect because the fabrics will shrink some. The polyester batting will not shrink. Um, or if it does, it'd be very, very minimal at, at best. So you'll get some of that crinkle. You'll get a little bit more crinkle with the cotton batting in there. So it kind of depends on what your overall look is you're going for. Um, the, the polyester batting tends to be a little, even on the lower loft, tends to have a little bit more fluff. Your batting or your stitching tends to sink into the fabric a little bit more than if you have a cotton bat, um, a cotton bat in there. But I think it, the biggest thing is consider what you want the overall look at the end to be like knowing that cotton always shrinks more, polyester bat will not. A polyester batting will help that quilt dry quicker in the, in the drying process when it is actually laundered because the batting doesn't have to dry out as much as a cotton batting does. It doesn't absorb the moisture into the fiber as much. So um, there's a lot of considerations. So you kind of make yourself a checklist, the pros and cons, and think about how you want it to the shrinkage to maybe be affected. Do you want drying time to be affected? Do you want um, the weight to be the biggest concern? So you're gonna have to weigh out or, you know, try a few different things. You know, do one this time with a polyester bat, next time go with a really low loft cotton bat and, you know, see the differences. All right, let's move to Anita's question next. Uh, Anita wants to know, what is the best way to square a king quilt after it is done and preparing for the binding? <laughs> Very good question. Hopefully, if it's been long-armed quilt, it's fair, quilted, it's fairly squared up already. But the biggest thing that I do in order to kind of make sure I create nice straight lines along the edges of my quilt is to use that long 24-inch ruler so that I can cut and trim a at least 24 inch section at a time. I also use the biggest square ruler I have at the corner sections so that I can create a nice right angle at that, at that point. That being said, not every quilt is perfectly square. And there are times when we just need to let a little bit of squish here and there go. It may not be perfect. But remember, quilt isn't graded by, unless it's going to be a show quilt or a competition quilt, a quilt isn't graded by every single 16th of an inch here or there that's not perfect. A quilt is graded on its warmth and how much it love and, and warmth and joy it brings to the person who uses it. So if your quilt isn't exactly perfect, that's okay. Let that go. <laughs> um, you can do a little bit because you have a quarter inch seam allowance on the outer edge of your quilt. So you have a little wiggle room there. But remember, you, you do want to have a seam allowance in the binding so you can't get too close to that raw edge. But um, you do have maybe a 16th or so or an eighth to, to a wib, of wiggle room there in order to create that. But I use my 24 inch ruler along the sides. I use my 12 well, I think I have a 14 and a half, actually. I have a, a larger one that I square that I will use in a corner as I approach it so that I can get a nice squared out, making sure that as you are working on trimming your quilt, that the weight of the quilt is being supported and that the portion on your cutting surface is laying square, because that's the other thing that can throw things off. If it's draped over the edge and being tugged on, you might get a skewed corner. Make sure that the quilt, the weight of the quilt is being supported either by the table or a chair or something next to you so that the portion that you lay onto your cutting table is laying out nice and flat and it's not being pulled and distorted there. So that's another thing to double check to make sure that you've got it laying out nice so that you can use that ruler in combinations of a large square ruler. Most of the time, I guess I've used probably a 12 and a half in the past. I've just acquired a 14 and a half down the road but that bigger square uh, ruler into the corner and then use my 24 inch ruler then along the sides as I approach the next corner. So just be careful, be cautious. If you're all worried, um, one technique to do is actually just use a um, marking tool first. A uh, friction pen, you can mark um, in, you know, along the batting, you can make marks for yourself. Sometimes using kind of a training wheel approach because cutting into it just seems very, very scary at first. 
And if you go ahead and mark your way around and then lay the quilt out, and then you'll know in your head, yes, it's ready to cut. Then you can go back and cut that excess off. So sometimes when it's a big quilt and it's really close to your heart that it needs to be right, sometimes marking it first and then cutting it helps us to relax and enjoy the process a bit. I felt like you were delivering that answer directly to me. <laughs> I, I've done this many times. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Especially if it's a quilt that's um, shaped along the outer edges. You know, if I'm working on a hexagon quilt or um, a tumbling block or something that's shaped, and maybe I want to cut it straight instead, and I'm going to be taking off some pieces, I will go in and mark it first because making it cut in the wrong place is just too scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we move on to our next question, I'm going to shout out a couple locations here. We have Frida joining us from Manitoulin Island in Canada. We also Yay. have Judy joining us from North Carolina. Hello, Frida. Hello, Judy. Um, and I'm going to take a brief moment. If you didn't join us right at the top of the hour, this is Kali Tauke. She's answering all of your questions quilting. That can be design, that can be technique tips, any kind of questions about tools, whatever you can think of for your quilting projects. We want your questions so that Colleen can give you some answers. And that's all going to take place in the chat box. So check that out. Let us know where you're viewing from, any questions you've got on your quilting projects. And also check out, there is a link for a free pattern. It is in the description of today's video. Colleen's gonna hold it up. This is the chicken mitten pothole <laughs> pattern. We've practiced saying it and you can have that free download. That is also available as a link in the chat box as well. So you can either find it in the description of the video or in the chat box, grab your free pattern and download it so you can get into your chicken mitten. So that's all from me. We're gonna jump back into our questions. And the next one actually does come from Judy in North Carolina. Uh, Judy is looking for your recommendations on quilting a soldier block, two inches wide, border around a quilt. So what do you think, Colleen? I'm not exactly what she means by a soldier block. That's a, an interesting um, a description because I don't exactly, it doesn't bring a picture to mind. Um, of exactly what that um, type of a border block would be. Um, mm -hmm. Whenever we're working in that outer border, it's always a little bit, it sometimes is, is scary for us because that's the dominant kind of trim for the outer edge of our quilt and making sure that it stays flat and looks well done is something that we really focus on. Um, if it possible that she could put up a, could upload a picture after our chat, I'll go in and see if I can do a little bit more research and talk with her about that because I'm curious of what kind of block it is. <laughs> right. So Judy, go ahead and uh, if you can send that in so Colleen can take a closer look, like she said, and get yeah. back in touch with you after that. Uh, also, if anybody watching has worked with Soldier Blocks, this is another great crowdsourcing uh opportunity. So drop any comments you would have for that into the chat box as well. A couple more hellos. We've got Jean viewing from Edinburgh, Scotland. We've got Barbara from Eustis, Florida. So really getting some people in from all over. Dara just came in from Toronto. So Dara says, I've basted, I've pinned, and I still have to be extremely careful to not have my backing become puckered when machine quilting. I've also made sure that my batting is the right way around. Do you have any tips here for Dara? Okay. Now, when we're working on quilts that we've pin based or even spray based, that's the biggest thing is having things shift around. Now, the kind of the um, standard that when I was first taught quilting uh, quite a few years back, uh, when we go to pin basting, a lot of times people... I, want, I don't want to say you got in a hurry, but you may have gotten in a hurry and want, and maybe not pinned as close as possible. Um, what the standard usually is with your fist, put that down on the quilt and think of four corners around your fist. So that means you're pinning about every three and a half to four inches. Um, because the closer you pin based, the less chance the fabric has to shift. And that's where the puckers come from is when the layers walk apart from each other and don't stay one on top. The other thing is to make sure that as you're quilting, 
and I know this is a really hard thing to do because I've done it myself, is to have something that supports the weight of the quilt while you're working with the piece under the machine. And you probably can only, you know, it's a small section that you're working on at a time, making sure that area is flat, that you can easily maneuver that piece. And it's kind of like piling up a mountain beside you um, in order to keep that weight from dragging and pulling because the pull of the rest of the quilt can also cause that shift. Um, the other thing is to make sure that the size of the pin you're using for basting is the smaller, oh, do I have a safety pin in my pin cushion? Of course I don't. Um, a lot of us tend to want to use the bigger safety pins, and I don't have one here, the larger safety pins when we're pin basting, just because they're easier to maneuver. But because the larger the pin, that piece that you actually put into the fabric is long, it has some shift back and forth. And that again can cause fabrics to shift. So the smaller of the pins, I think they're like a one or a one and an eighth inch, they're the smaller safety pin is the style you should be using in order to keep that layer from, the layers from shifting back and forth. Um, so pin basting, maybe even doing a pin basting and a spray based. Um, the other thing that you can do is hand based and you can find videos about hand basting. It's a very, it's done with just, um, it can be done either single strand of thread or double strand. And it's basically just taking and making a long running stitch across areas of your quilt from side to side, top to bottom that you can add in. If you don't want to invest in more safety pins, you can do this, the hand basting. Um, that can also help keep those layers together. It just puts a stop between maybe if you did pin basting every you know five or six inches, you may want to hand baste down between those. And that's the stop that will keep those layers from shifting on you. Um, remember always to work on a small area at a time and reposition as you go. It's going to take a lot to do a large quilt and in a domestic sewing machine and you're going to want to take breaks often because your shoulders and your hands are going to take a lot of wear and tear in this process so realize it's going to take you a while that's okay it's a process you're not in this as a marathon to hurry and have the best time it's to, to um as in how long it takes you to do it it's more about finishing a section at a time and then kind of checking that off in your head i've completed this for the day I'm done, now I walk away and do something else, come back another day and do another section because that shifting and puckering just causes a lot of frustration. Um, there are quilters out there who have taught for years and years and they come to the conclusion there are two ways to quilt, either by machine or by check. And some people will get to that point where they're, uh, they can produce quilt tops faster than they can than actually do the quilting themselves. And that's when long arm quilters come into play. We, we can quilt by check and hand those off to the long armor to complete. And then we do the binding to finish. And there's nothing wrong with that process either. So re uh, realize that you don't have to do every step yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this actually touched on Marsha's question as well. Uh, Marsha was looking for the best way to keep the quilt sandwich together for quilting. Now, Marsha did add in, um, so she's always getting puckers, even when using the quilter select powder to baste as well as safety pins. So I know you addressed the pins and things like that. Now, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit more about that quilter select powder what that does, how to use it properly, what might help if you're using that for your quilt sandwich? It is um, a product that's applied to the batting and then you use heat from an iron, um, similar to a, um, a fusible batting, except that you can turn any batting into a fusible. So by putting that product over the batting and then laying your fabric over the top, the heat of the iron then helps fuse that temporarily layers together so that you, um, will have less shift. Some people don't like to use aerosols, so there are spray based out there, but the powder version some people find is less objectionable smell, it's not as messy. They can control the area that they uh, apply the product. So look into that as a possibility also. All right. Well, thanks for touching on all of that. Uh, that seems to be a popular question here today with our quilters that are watching. Uh, drop in any more 
topics on this, uh, any more details that you want to talk about, feel free to put those in the chat box. But we're going to move away from the quilt sandwich for our next question. Uh, we're going to go to Allie next. And Allie says, I need to sew my 35 blocks together for a quilt that I'm making. What is the best strategy for sewing them to ensure that the rows and columns are straight and hence the quilt ends up with even sides? What strategy? <laughs> That's that's a really important thing that the rows actually fit together when we're done because here we've created all of these beautiful blocks and we want the end product to to also look as fabulous. So mm -hmm. the the technique is to lay your blocks out so that you know the arrangement that you want. Um, my living room floor tends to be my design area a lot. Sometimes it's the bed. Sometimes. I've got something actually on the wall um, to put my blocks out, but lay out your blocks to make sure you have them in the proper alignment and then work on a row at a time. If you have 35 blocks, more than likely it's five blocks one direction, seven blocks the other, seven times five. So um, create the easiest way I, for me, I guess in my head, I I'll automatically go five blocks across. So I'm picking up five blocks to put into a row. Now, when you go to, to join two blocks together, whether they have sashing between them or it's block to block, instead of just taking those two blocks and putting them right side together and taking the machine and zip across, take a, a, the time to actually pin the beginning of the seam and the end of the seam and the center so that we don't get a shift. Because what can happen, because there are feed dogs in our sewing machine on the bottom that will feed the fabric through, but our presser foot is is smooth on the bottom and that may feed the layers a little bit different rate and one can get stretched or distorted when you're um when you get to the end of the seam so if you pin the beginning and the end and the middle you kind of ensure that you um kind of keep everything sandwiched properly so that if your blocks are all the same size that when you sew those you don't get a distortion and that your five blocks across will all be the same in a nice uh, row across and then repeat that process through all seven rows that you're creating then go back and join the rows together again match up seam allowances between block one and two of the first row with block the seam that falls between block one and two of the second row by matching up those seam allowances as you go across before you start sewing pin the very beginning pin the very end and then pin each of the intersections where the blocks are going to, um, where the seams intersect between blocks, and then pin it a little bit more in between that just to keep things sandwiched on top of each other nice and neat. Um, if there are any points that you're wanting to hit and not clip, um, do a little pin match through those so that you're, as your intersection of seams, you get nice points there by doing a pin match. So that way, as you work one row at a time, getting that row nice and straight, then when you join your second row to it, you should ensure that they fit together. Again, pin the beginning, pin the end, pin at every intersection between blocks. So if you have five blocks across, you're going to have four intersections to pin to the between row one and row two. And that will help keep things from sliding because some of us get in a hurry and and I'm I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes I pick up my rows and I think I know exactly what I'm doing and I put them together and I get to the other end and all of a sudden one side is a quarter inch longer than the other because I've just kind of let them slip through the machine and not really kept them intact where they need to be so that they fit together properly. So all of those great blocks that you created, just take a little time, do a little pinning, and then you should be able to create rows and rows that fit together perfectly for um, a nice quilt top. Do take time to pit, uh, to um, press as you go. Say in row one, all of the seam, seams where you join blocks together, and it's it doesn't matter which direction you start. You just need to alternate. Um, all of if if there's no sashing between blocks, press seam allowances all in one direction. And then in row two, go all the other direction. That way you have intersecting or opposing seams that you can nest together nicely. And that will help keep your um, quilt top nice and square. And it makes sure that you get up from the, from the sewing machine to the iron and press in between. Because having to press an entire quilt top at the very end 
can lead to distortion. It, it can be um, very cumbersome to press individual seams once it's all assembled. It's much easier to always put in a seam, go to the iron, put in the next seam, go to the iron, so that you have very flat patchwork um, as you're trying to put pieces together. So some things to think about, pinning, pressing, um, taking your time, <laughs> and it should all fit together properly. All right, I'm going to go back to Judy's question next because Judy dropped in a little bit more of a specific description for that uh, soldier block. Mm -hmm. So Judy says she's not on Facebook, isn't quite sure oh. how to send you a so that's why we're getting a little bit more detailed description okay. here. Uh, the soldier blocks on Judy's border, it's two inch wide strips sewn together. And after a long strip is made, it's added to the outer border of the quilt. So she oh, has four okay. by blocks in each corner, like brick layers will do bricks standing side by side over door tops. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a cornerstone. Yeah. It, it, it's a different name for a border. We, a lot of us would call that piano keys. So if it's two inches okay. wide and there are pieces coming out the end, um, a lot of us call that piano keys. Looks like the, the keyboard on a piano. So there are a lot of different ways you could approach quilting those kinds of blocks. Um, what you could do is do an outline on each side of the seam and just do straight seaming off from the center of your quilt to the outer edge. Some people will go back and um, maybe um, do a zigzag, kind of a, hmm, how do I describe it? Um, there's a, long arm quilters have lots of names for different patterns. So that's the thing I'm trying to think. Um, kind of a um, ribbon candy design back and forth in every other of those pieces so that one is unquilted. The next one would have that stitching going back and forth through it. Um, that's an option. Um, what would be another, you could do, um, cross hatching if you want to go back and, and do something like that, um, at a, at a right angle through that. Um, and then when you get to the corner, you would just keep doing that cross hatch into the corner also. Um, oh gosh, there's so many possibilities. Some, um, will do, um, like two narrow stitching lines right through the middle of each of those blocks. Um, Hmm. I think they call that, um, now I'm going to draw a blank. Well, like Wayne's coating, the stripes on Wayne's coating, um, on, on, um, when you, when you're doing finishing in a home that has two little lines next to each other, kind of like pinstriping. Um, there are so many possibilities out there for doing, um, those kinds of border, uh, treatments that, um, I would probably just do a little bit of, Oh, you're not on Facebook though. But if you're on the computer watching this, it means you know how to type into a search engine. So possibly type in quilted piano key borders and then tap images. And you'll have more ideas than you ever can imagine um, to come up with. But a lot of the very classic designs are just going a quarter inch each side of that seam. And that would be enough to hold everything in place. Give it a little texture without going overboard. It's very simple to do because you can use the edge of your um, walking foot um, or a ruler if you're on a long arm. I don't know which kind of machine you're using for your quilting process. But following that seam line a quarter inch each side of it, you have a very good visual line there to follow. So that is probably the most classic way to finish. And then um, into the cornerstone or area, maybe just some simple outlining there around seam allowances, doing maybe kind of a fan-shaped lines into the corner so that that straight line kind of continues around the corner and then, then continues on, on each side of the seam allowance. So, or the seam that joins pieces together. So those are the classic ways that I would approach it. And I've seen friends approach those kinds of borders. So I hope that helps. All right. And Lorna just dropped in a suggestion of serpentine. So, or serpentine, oh, yeah. how you would to say it. <laughs> yep. Serpentine. Just the, I call those lazy lines because they don't have to be yeah. perfect. Or you can mm -hmm. set your machine if your machine does a serpentine stitch and you can just let the machine do the zigzag or the, the wave on if you're doing a domestic machine. So lots of possibilities. 
All right. Well, maybe jump on another Q&A in the future. Let us know what you decided on and how it worked, yeah. Judy. We would love to hear the updates. Uh, we're going to go to Barbara next. So first, this is Barbara's project. Uh, it sounds really fantastic. Barbara says she's currently working on an applique planet quilt using fabric from mm. a deceased family member for a special young man. So this sounds like a close to the mm. heart quilting project. Um, and then Barbara wants to know relating to batting, should one use with or without scrim and needle punched or not? So what do you think about that? Okay. Does she say that she's hand quilting or machine quilting? I didn't um, catch she that portion. Of that. Keep an eye on okay. any opt in details. Okay. Well, if you are going to be hand quilting this project, you are going to want to pick a batting that does not have a scrim. That is the kind of the invisible layer that they put on the back of batting that helps it keep its shape so that it can be tugged and pulled when it's on a long arm or on a domestic sewing machine so it doesn't become distorted. Now, they don't put that on some batting because people are wanting to hand quilt through that. And the power with which the needle can go through fabric on a domestic machine or a long arm is a lot. But our fingers are not that powerful. So we want to always use a batting without a scrim for hand quilting. The other um, choices, if it's going to be machine quilted, long arm quilted, um, those others won't really matter whether or not, I mean, it, you're going to pick a batting with a scrim just because for the maneuverability, so you don't, it doesn't become um, distorted or ripped or get a thin spot in it. Needle punched or not needle punched doesn't really matter too much at this point when, when you're doing machine quilting um, because of its stability it, under the machine, it's, it's fine. But always look for that um, batting that does not have a scrim if you're going to be doing hand quilting. That being said, I have been crazy enough to not realize the difference early on in my quilting experience. Um, I did one project, hand quilted, a small, mm, a little, about the size of this little wall hanging beside me. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't know the difference yet. And as I was hand quilting through it, it was chewing up my fingers, literally. And I kept thinking, why is this so hard? Because I'm thinking, if hand quilting is this difficult and you needed quilts in your in your cedar chest in order to get married someday, I'd have been a, I would have never have gotten married because I would never have made another quilt in my entire life realizing, not realizing that we're scrim on the batting because I'd used a piece of batting left over from a previous project that was machine quilted. And so I can definitely attest to the fact that a scrim really slows down the, bat, the, the hand stitching process. The needle doesn't want to slide through very well. Um, if you're going to hand quilt and you want something that will hand quilt very nicely as a batting, you may want to consider using a wool batting. Wool batting is beautiful for hand quilting. The needle slides gently through it. Um, it. It gives a great loft. It's not a super heavy um, fiber to put in between layers. Um, it's a washable wool today, the, the types of batting. In the, in the past, years and years ago, people worried about whether or not the wool was going to shrink excessively, but wool battings today are are not our um, are washable wool, so it's not gonna be a problem about excessive shrinking. So if you're gonna be hand quilting, you might wanna even consider using a wool batting. You could also use a polyester batting. So I hope that helps. Sounds like your project is going to be beautiful. Yes, and Barbara is machine quilting, so uh -huh. she could take those machine quilting tips yep. from you on this. Yep. Uh, all right, uh, before we get to our next questions, we have about 20 minutes left in today's Q&A with Colleen. So if you haven't dropped a question into the chat box yet and you want to, now is probably the time. We do have quite a few more questions to get to and we'll go right up to the end of the hour and finish off as many as we can. Uh, but if you're hanging on to a question, now is the time to drop it into the chat box so we have a chance to get to it before we have to say goodbye today. Uh, that being said, we're gonna jump right into the next one and this one comes from Heather. Heather is curious about some washing situations here. So 
Couple questions all about washing. Heather is currently working on a shadow box quilt that will have many red fabrics pieced together for the backing. So Heather wants to know, should she wash the reds before using? If so, how many times? And if the backing is washed, should the top also be washed before you do the sandwiching and the quilting? So what do you have to say about all of that washing? Okay. <laughs> reds can be notorious depending on mm -hmm. the quality of your fabric. Um, and if you don't know for sure where the fat, if you know, if you acquired the fabric from someone else and you don't know where it originated, it, whether or not it's been printed, if it's a batik, if it's a lower, maybe a little lower quality, or if it comes from an actual quilt shop, um, those red fabrics and even deep purple and navy blue sometimes can be scary fabrics to work with. Now, if you would like it, most of the time, Quilters who are a little nervous on this area want to wash that fabric ahead of time. So here are a few ways to approach that. You can use um, a color catcher sheet in with the wash uh, in order to kind of grab any of that uh, excess dye that may not have been well set into the fibers in order to keep um, to see if it's going to bleed and continue doing that until the color catcher sheet comes out white. It looks kind of like a dryer sheet, but it's a little bit heavier than that. It has a chemical on it that releases into the water, goes and grabs the, the excess dyes that are floating in the water and keeps them from redepositing. Now, that being said, there's another approach that you can do, um, a product called Retain. And it comes in a plastic bottle. Um, it is a product that you put also into wash water. Um, read the manufacturer's instructions for how much and how much water to use in proportion to the retained product. What it does is fixes the dye to the fibers. And then you can wash after that to make sure that it is settled and set into the fabric. So just follow the instructions for retain and that will fix the dye onto the fabric. Now, once either you have either washed it with a color catcher to loosen the dye and get it all out, or use the retain to fix the dye. Um, the rest of the fabrics in that project, you may also want to then wash before you cut um, in order to kind of get everything to the same point. Because a lot of times when I start on a project, I'm starting with brand new fabric and I cut everything, assemble my quilt top and patchwork, my quilt, and then wash it afterwards so that everything shrinks at the same rate. If you've already re uh, washed that one fabric, that red in there, you're going to want to wash the other fabrics also before you begin so that everybody's kind of on the same uh, shrinkage rate. <laughs> they get that washing process and drying process, then everybody's at the same point. So it will um, shrink at the same. It won't be excessive in one area over another after the quilt is completed. Now, once a quilt is completed, and you want to um, launder a quilt and you may still be a little bit nervous about what might happen with dyes. Um, there is um, a product called Xenthropol that's, uh, that can be used to, it's, it's also comes in a plastic bottle like the Retain, goes into the wash cycle. It goes in and grabs all dye that's loose and keeps it as a detergent that will take that dye and keep it from redepositing back onto the fibers. So you may want to have both of those in your um, in your laundry room at different times. Use them in different ways. Um, it just it depends on how much it, how big the project is, how often it might be laundered. Um, a lot of my quilts don't get excessively laundered. So um, whether or not later you can maybe even just use a color catcher sheet in with your quilt um, to make sure that that loose dye, I kind of think that the color catcher, catcher sheets have the same kind of pro product in them as that, de that detergent so that it goes in and grabs dye and keeps it from redepositing. It's just in a smaller dose and comes on a sheet instead. So I, that don't quote me on that because I have not matched up the chemical <laughs> compounds in both of those, but they act the same. So that way I'm thinking they're probably similar in their compounds. But there are a lot of things to think about, especially when you're working on with something that's red that you're afraid may um, bleed later. Uh, we have a lot of quilters who are listening and watching right now 
they have experience with um, things, die, uh, the, the reds or even other colors transferring and migrating to other parts of quilts and have had to go back and wash um, and had good luck using some uh, products like Dawn dishwashing soap, uh, a mild detergent to help release some of that um, bleed that happens in quilts. But um, also remember that things happen to quilts. You know, it, it might not bleed now, but something other, uh, some other thing might happen to it later. So our quilts are meant to be loved and used and whether or not they're perfect at all times in their existence, we have to kind of let go of. You know, if a little bit of a bleed here works, happens here or there, it's not the end of the world, but you can try and do what you can with the products available to either release dyes now or, or to fix dyes. So um, investigate those. All right, best of luck to you, Heather. Uh, we're going to go to a sizing question next, Colleen, and this one comes in okay. from Mary. So Mary wants to know, how many more yards do I need if I am making a 58, 58 inch by 70 inch for backing if she wants to do a quilt and go? Hmm, okay. <laughs> so it's 50, yeah, this is a, this is a math involved. Basically your, your quilt top is 58 by 70 or mm -hmm. thereabouts. Okay, so what you're gonna need is two lengths that are two and a quarter yards long. <laughs> and why do I come up with that? Okay, 70 is the length of your quilt. 72 is two yards. So you need a little bit more than that. So like a yard and a quarter is probably about what you need for length and one piece, but you need two to cover that. Or if your seam's gonna go the other way. Now it also depends on the type of backing fabric, if it has a directional print, if it happens to be a stripe or a floral that you're trying to match up, um, you could use, go the other direction, seam it through the, the, through the kind of the equator, go two pieces this direction. If it's 58, you could do, let's see, <sighs> 60 inches is five yards, you're all, or five feet, you're probably going to end up with four yards, just about uh, four yards, a little bit less fabric the other way with a little bit less waste. So two yards this way and, and another piece, two yards, seam through the middle, kind of the belly button <laughs> approach. And you would have enough to do, then it would make it 88 by 70 or so. If you're gonna do a quilt as you go, that would give you enough room to center everything and work your way out as you create it. Um, I, if you're doing a quilt as you go and in another technique, I'm not exactly sure. If you're doing it in rows and things, it, that might not be the math that works. I just don't know the extent of your quilt as you go. If you're going to be doing the quilt as you go in rows and then assembling it on to that center, but somewhere around four yards to four and a half yards approximately would be your backing fabric. All right, good. That's a good point to start from. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for doing all that for us today. <laughs> well, the, as my G, uh, an algebra teacher used to always tell me, and because I, I was terrible at math, <laughs> he would always like draw out what you know. So draw a picture of your quilt top. It doesn't have to be perfectly to scale, but put the numbers on it: fifty-eight one direction, seven to the other. Draw it out, and then think about laying out pieces of widths of fabric on top of that in either direction to see which is the most efficient. And then that will help give you a visualization of the math because <laughs> I had to see the math. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's how I always do it. Yeah, that visualization I'm sure helps a lot, probably for a lot of our quilters out there too. Very visual people, I believe we've mm -hmm. got watching. A uh, couple hellos before we get into our next question. So we've got Janet watching from my home state of Pennsylvania. Hello oh. to Janet. Uh, and we have Amy. She's in Beaverton, Oregon. And Amy is working on the tulip pattern that you shouted out at the top of the hour, Colleen. So Amy's doing that while she listens to the Q&A. So that's Perfect. exciting and springy. So thank you, Amy. <laughs> uh, Rosie's got a really fun question. Uh, Rosie wants to know, Colleen, how to prevent getting bored with sewing a top? 
<laughs> How to get to keep from getting bored? Hmm. Well, in a lot of patchwork, we repeat the same skills over and over. And mm -hmm. we do need to stay focused in order to not put things together in the wrong process, in the wrong order. That's true. But what I tend to do is I tend to take my phone and find my favorite either radio station or podcast. I have a cordless speaker in my sewing studio. I turn that up so that my brain has something else to think about if I'm doing something very repetitive. But before I turn that on, I set up an entire section of what I'm going to be working on. Say I'm working on the Tulip Tango pro project where I make a lot of triangle squares, two at a time, or I'm doing some that are eight at a time. I will do all of my cutting without the radio because I really need to concentrate on the numbers and my cutting so everything is accurate. I do all my cutting. Then I will mark the pieces so that I know, okay, these I'm making two at a time process. And I pair them all up and I lay them beside my machine so that I know all of these are gonna be the exact same process. Then I turn on the radio or my podcast or a TV show if you've got a television in your um, studio. But then I know I'm going to repeat this skill over and over and I don't have to concentrate quite as much here because I have them marked. They're ready to go. They're all the same thing over and over. Then I can, you know, do the cutting and the pressing. That's kind of mindless. You know, our brains kind of go into overdrive. We, we know that we have to trim here. We have to slice there and that we always press and I save a whole bunch that I have to press at the same time because it's easier for me to go to the iron and then just press a whole bunch of triangle squares at once. And then I can be listening to that radio or whatever, but we also remember to take breaks, take breaks, go outside. If you can get some sunshine, walk around the block, um, kind of getting that fresh air perspective helps you come back to the project and kind of have a little bit more, um, and enthusiasm for it. There are times when some projects we get into it and we're thinking, why did we start this? Um, at that point, put it away. <laughs> just give it a little time out in the corner. Don't put it away so far that you totally forget about it, but just give it a little time out um, and come back to it on another day. Trying to force um, creativity is kind of a hard thing to do and it can cause more unsewing than sewing. So that that's not fun and that's not joy. <laughs> so um, tr try to always work at the best part of the day for you, if possible. If mornings are better for you and you have that capability to sit down and sew in the mornings, maybe that's the time when you're the freshest. Sometimes it's for some people, it's coming home after work, after supper, and just having you know, 30 minutes of peace and quiet in their sewing room where they can just work on something. But if you can set it up ahead of time so that you know, I'm going to work on these pieces. And when I get done, I've accomplished X, Y, and Z. And then I'll go on to, you know, ABC next later. But one, you know, kind of just eat the giant one bite at a time because quilts are big and there's a lot of steps involved. So pick one thing at a time to focus on and remember to get some fresh air and sunshine in between. Absolutely. All right. Let's go uh, dig a little bit into the creativity you just commented on. Linda has been saving some blue and yellow fabrics for a while now and wants to make a quilt for a queen sized bed. So Linda wants to know how you go about choosing a pattern when you have like 15 to 19 different fabrics. Uh, what would you say? Okay. Um, I've been there, done that. Um, <laughs> I've done those kinds of scrappy quilts and I think I had probably more than like 30 or 40 different fabrics to go into it. You need to pick a pattern unless your heart is set on one certain design, pick a pattern that is very scrappy friendly. Um, because otherwise you're going to get locked into, I have to use this fabric in this spot every time and you may not have enough to go there. So this is going to be where you're going to need to let go. Blue goes in the blue spot, yellow goes in the yellow spot, and whichever fabric comes up next is going in, where you kind of have to let a little bit of that go. But a scrappy style pattern, something that works well with scrappy style is a good thing. Um, something to look at uh, might be even like a pineapple quilt. Um, if you've never made one of those, research pineapple quilts. You can make them very scrappy. 
um, and it uses up a lot of pieces and creates a really interest in, in intricate design. But there are a lot of patterns out there. Basically, I sort through images on, uh, on my computer a lot to get ideas or Pinterest places to, and if there's one or two that keep coming back to you, that's the design maybe where you need to go. Um, I think I've probably bought Storm at Sea pattern, I think three times. I have yet to make one. It's gonna be on my list at some point, but it's a very intricate pattern. There's a lot, lot of detail in it, but it can be made scrappy also. But I think the biggest hurdle to get over is letting it be scrappy, letting the blues fall in where you're gonna say, okay, in spot A, B, and C is always gonna be a blue, and then D, E, F is always going to be a yellow. And just let those pieces fall into the quilt there. But picking a quilt pattern is very in, um, individual. It's very subjective. What speaks to my heart may not speak to yours, which not, may not speak to your best friend who is a quilter. So go through designs until one just keeps calling you. Every time you see it pop up, that's the quilt you may want to make. So look for Patterns, though, that are written for scrappy versions so that you know if it says um, like a total of so many fat quarters or so many yards of blues and so many yards of yellows or so many fat quarters of yellows. It will help you also uh, make sure that you have enough fabric to cover the design. Um, something you may want to consider is one background fabric as a unifying factor. So if you've got that um, really great selection of blues and a great selection of yellows, you may want to use a bright white or a white with a very, very small print to it um, as a background to kind of unify those fabrics. So look through images, look through for patterns that, that really refer to scrappy as a style, and then just jump in. There's always more quilts to be made. If it's not, it, if that one wasn't the perfect one, there's always a next one. <laughs> Well, Linda already commented, scrappy it will be. So very helpful tips on that, Colleen. Thank you. Uh, let's go. Let's see how many more questions we can get in. One or two, maybe even three. Frida's is next. Uh, Frida tries to use a monofilament thread on a baby quilt and the machine, mm. it would get a needle <laughs> error, not do a full rotation. So <laughs> didn't have any issues. Do you have suggestions on working with that monofilament thread? Monofilament can be a little bit tricky. Um, mm -hmm. Some of our sewing machines just don't like it. <laughs> Other machines are fine with it. Um, one thing that I have found helpful, and let's see if I can find one in my drawer or, or if it's upstairs. There's a little netting that can go over the top of, and I don't have one down here. As a little netting that's like a sleeve that can go over your monofilament thread to keep it from looping off the machine too fast. And that's usually the fix for my machine. It looks like the kind of netting you might see um, brought over the top of really delicate flowers in transport. It's just a mesh that kind of um, expands and contracts. And it just is, a, you can find them in quilt shops, you can find them on, online, um, they slip over the top of your spool and keep that from looping off slower. So, because the machine pulls up and pulls the thread off, but monofilament has nothing to hold it on the spool. There are no fibers there for it to slow down. So once it gets a pull, it just comes looping off like crazy. And then it tends to get stuck either around the spool pin or some other area of your sewing machine, which makes the thread snap because all of a sudden it's got kind of a knot back on itself and it can't stop itself and it just snaps it. So every time I've used monofilament and had and not thought about it, um, I've had thread snap and then it's like, oh, where's that little sleeve, that little guy that slips over the top of my spool and slows down the feed, that will be the ticket for using monofilament. So that little tiny sleeve, it's, it doesn't cost much. Sometimes they came, they sometimes come with sewing machines. So if you happen to have that little pouch of, of supplies, and mine probably is buried somewhere in here, but there's usually a little vinyl bag there that comes with your sewing machine and all the attachments. 
look inside there and see if there's this little white collapsible and you're like what is this thing ah it might be you might already have one <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to have to leave a few questions here unanswered. Uh, thank you so much for sending all of your questions in. We do these Q&As about once a month. So there is going to be another one before you know it. Uh, I will like to point out we've had a couple people are working on applique projects that they've dropped into the chat box. And we had a question about that that we're going to have to hold. So Colleen, maybe tuck into your brain a little bit of app tips for the next time that we are okay. together. I'm sure people will appreciate that. Uh, so before we leave, Colleen, I would love for you to give us a little refresher of what's coming up. Also, let us know where to find you in the meantime before I send us off with some last minute reminders. So first, Colleen. Okay, so next week we have coming up the Earth Day project. I've got a curb cover picnic quilt um, project from reuse, repurposed blue jean fabric. So if you're at all interested in um, a project for the Earth Day uh, event, come and join us then. That's um, I think on next Tuesday. Um, I also have a um, video coming up on Facebook Live on National Culture Circle and Craftsy of a Too Hot to Handle. It's a uh, cover for a casserole. So. Um, we are out moving about and getting out and seeing friends, doing things through our churches, doing different quilt groups. And if you're wanting to take along a warm or even a cold dish, this could be the carrier that you might want to make for the, your next event or as a gift for maybe some quilters or someone getting married soon. So um, you can find me on Facebook. Um, I will pop in a national quilter circle if you if you put things up there of projects you're working on. I'd love to see um, where, what you're working on currently. Um, I love that someone's out there making the Tulip Tango uh, table runner. So, and don't forget about the chicken mitten. If you're looking for a little fast project, we've got the pattern and the download in the chat. So until next time. Thanks, Leah. Perfect. You took the words right out of my mouth, Colleen. Make sure if you didn't already and you're looking for a free pattern to download and dig into, that chicken mitten pattern is a link that's either in the description of the video or in the chat box. If you didn't get your question answered or you just have more for Colleen, please keep an eye on the National Quilter Circle. We will be back in the next month with another Q&A. We'll get your questions answered then. But until then, my name is Leah on behalf of Colleen and our entire team behind the scenes. Thank you so much for joining us today. And until we see you the next time, happy quilting.